Good afternoon, everyone. With me is the woman on my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persa Kelly. To her right, the Department of Health's Communicable Disease Service Medical Director, Dr. Ed Lifshitz. Great to have you both. Guy to my left who needs no introduction, the Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan. We've got Paramount Garg, Chief Counsel, and cast of thousands. A few things before we get to the latest numbers. First, as you venture out tomorrow, you'll notice that our flags will have been lowered to half staff. Today, I ordered that they will be lowered tomorrow in honor of the late four-star U.S. Army General Ray Odierno, a Rockaway native who passed away last weekend, a great soldier. Second, we are mourning the loss of another great soldier, along with the nation, the death of former Secretary of State and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Colin Powell, who passed away from complications of COVID-19. As we learn more about his arrangements, we will be lowering the flags in his honor as well. Raised in the South Bronx, he was a rare top military leader and that he rose through the ranks after having joined the Army in 1958 from the ROTC at the City College of New York instead of attending West Point. By the time he retired from the Army in 1993, in addition to his four stars, he was also awarded two Purple Hearts, the Bronze Star and the Presidential Medal of Freedom, among numerous other honors. He was the first African American to serve as National Security Advisor, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Secretary of State. As a soldier, a diplomat, he gave his all to his nation, and we are forever grateful. I was actually with the General on July 15th uh, in the White House, ironically awaiting the return of our COVID test to allow us then to go on to have dinner with Angela Merkel. He was in great form, as always. He and I had crossed paths over the years, particularly in my diplomatic life, and he was a giant. So to his wife, and widow Alma, and the rest of the Powell family, <clears throat> excuse me, our thoughts and prayers are with them. Switching gears, this week marks Utility Assistance Week. As many families across the state know, the economic fallout from the pandemic has left many unable to pay their utility bills. But through the Department of Community Affairs and the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, help is available. If you are behind on your utility payments, I strongly encourage you to visit and apply for any state assistance programs available to you. We added $250 million in federal funds to our relief program, so the help you need is there for you. Moreover, uh, remember that the grace period for utility shutoffs related to non Payments due to a COVID-related hardship only lasts until the end of this year, December 31st. So if you owe money on your utilities, you have until December 31st to pay what you owe, arrange a payment plan, or apply for assistance and not risk losing service. <clears throat> for a one-stop page to learn more about the assistance plans in place, please visit the Board of Public Utilities website, nj.org gov slash bpu it's that website at the bottom of that slide nj.gov slash bpu and then click on a link for assistance programs the link is assistance programs that page will give you eligibility information and help you fill out an application and eligibility for two assistance programs the universal service fund and the fresh start programs have been expanded to allow many more households to qualify. For example, the cutoff for the Universal Service Fund for a family of four is income at or below $106,000. So you may be eligible for assistance even if you thought you were not. I cannot stress strongly enough the importance of applying for the assistance for which you are eligible. And again, time is of the essence as the grace period for shutoffs only runs until December 31st. Again, the website is nj.gov slash bpu. <clears throat> now let's turn our attention, if we can, to today's numbers. We'll start, as we usually do, with the latest vaccination counts as of this morning. And we'll be watching, and Judy and her team will certainly be watching, both the FDA and the CDC processes over the coming days as final determinations are likely to be made regarding booster shots for those of you who have received either the Moderna or Johnson & Johnson vaccines. In both cases, we are preparing for the approval of boosters for you, 
and we will be ready to provide those doses to you once the final approval is granted and guidance disseminated. And while we're on vaccines, here's the latest report on breakthrough infections among the fully vaccinated compiled by the Department of Health's Communicable Disease Service. These latest numbers take us through October 4. As you can see here, the vaccines in our toolkit are continuing to perform exceptionally well, with still more than 99% of the fully vaccinated remaining COVID-free and greater than 99.9% .9 effective against COVID-related hospitalization and death. And here's the preliminary data for the week of September 27th through October 3rd. And here I want you to point your attention to the number of hospitalizations due to COVID-19 statewide among the fully vaccinated, 17. You can see that. And during the week, our hospitals through the New Jersey Hospital Association's data portal reported 834 new admissions of COVID-positive individuals. I know Ed and Judy would warn us against comparing apples and oranges as, as these are distinctive sets of data between the NJHA numbers on the one hand and the CDS numbers on the other hand. But accepting that for a minute, 834 reported COVID positive hospitalizations on the one hand and 17 among fully vaccinated on the other. These numbers speak from their, them, themselves. I am certain that with General Powell's tragic passing, we're gonna, it's going to put a bright light on breakthrough infections and deaths. But keep in mind, too, that since January 19th, the day when the very first folks who received a vaccine became fully vaccinated, Dr. Ed and his team have confirmed 6,508 losses of life due to complications from COVID. Of these, roughly 215 or 3%, pardon me, of these 215, roughly 3%, have been of fully vaccinated individuals, and that includes both the spring surge as well as the Delta variant surge. So while I certainly understand that the death of a notable person, a hero like General Powell from a breakthrough infection will make headlines and may make you question your vaccination, the reality is that the vaccinations are highly protective and getting your booster shot when it's available will only enhance that protection. And Judy, I don't have any insights into the general's health, but I have read reports this morning that he had some other comorbidities, and we know that always puts you in a higher level of risk. So God bless him and God rest his soul. Here are today's newly reported positive PCR and presumed positive antigen test results. Notably, both the rate of transmission and the test positivity rate are continuing to move in the right directions. And here are the cases that our hospitals were dealing with yesterday. And here it is notable that yesterday was the sixth consecutive day with total hospitalizations remaining below 900. Uh, and here are today's newly confirmed COVID-related deaths. The number of probable deaths has been revised and currently stands, as you can see, at 2,810. God bless every single one of them. As we do every time we're together, let's honor three more of those we've lost. We're going to begin down in Cherry Hill with Donald Agron who proudly served in the United States Navy from 1958 to 1964. He was 79 years old. In the Navy, Don was assigned to the destroyer USS Charles H. Roan. When his days at sea ended, he returned to New Jersey to become a union carpenter and a member of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners, Local 393 in Camden. Don left behind to carry his memory his beloved wife of 55 years, Jean, along with his sons, Andrew, with whom I had the great honor of speaking last Wednesday, and his sons, Stephen and Paul, and their families, including his six grandchildren, Andrew, Matthew, Oliver, Isaac, Kira, and Brendan. He's also survived by sisters Doris and Martha. Everyone who knew Don will remember him for his kindness, his sense of nature, and his dedication to his faith. With that, we thank him for his service to our nation, and may God bless and watch over him and the family he leaves behind. Next up, we recall Bloomfield's Patricia Dorata, who passed at the age of 66 when COVID provided grave complications for her ongoing treatment for cancer. A Bloomfield native, Patricia worked for the Bloomfield Board of Education, handling a myriad of jobs 
for the district's special education department from taking on the task of submitting required reports to the Department of Education, to ensuring students had the access they needed, when needed, for home instruction. Her dedication to Bloomfield will live on in the town's community garden, to which she dedicated many hours. Pat left behind to carry on her legacy, her daughters Jennifer, with whom I had the great honor of speaking last Wednesday, and Janine, and son Drew, and their spouses, respectively Jason, Mark, and Kerry. She also left behind six grandchildren, Peyton, Milena, Lila, Max, Tessa, and Andrew. She is also survived by her brothers and sisters, Richard, Doreen, Joan, Albert, Cynthia, Tom, Ron, and Ken, and their families, including her dear friend and sister-in-law, Nancy. We thank Patricia for her service to the children and community of Bloomfield, and may God bless and watch over her memory and the family she leaves behind. And finally, for today, for today, we honor the life of this guy, Donald Cody, who passed away in late September after a long COVID-related illness. Don was the brother of former governor, state senator, dear friend to many, including Tammy and me, Dick Cody. Don dedicated much of his professional life to our state's horse racing industry, serving across his career as a presiding judge at the Meadowlands Racetrack, president of the Freehold Raceway, and assistant director of the New Jersey Racing Commission. But in true Cody family fashion, he was also passionate about basketball, and he was an assistant coach at Seton Hall under former and renowned coach and current broadcaster Bill Raftery. Don was active in numerous community Irish faith-based and sports organizations and gave generously of his time in support of countless scholarships and charities. He left behind his wife Irma and his children and their families, daughter Melissa and son-in-law Kyle, son Donald III and his wife Renee, and son Sean, and a bench full of grandchildren, and Angelina, Olivia, Gabriella, Michael, Matthew, Mia, Katie, Kyle, and Logan. Don is also survived by his sisters, Pat, sister Pat Cody, who is another dear friend, and she and I exchanged notes this morning, his sister Colleen, as I mentioned, his brother Dick and his brother Robert, and many beloved nie nieces, nephews, and dear friends and former colleagues. We thank Don for all that he did to protect our state's horse racing industry and for his commitment to so many worthy causes. May God bless and watch over him and the whole Cody family. They've had a run rough run of late, so please keep Team Cody in your prayers. Now let's give a shout out, switching gears to another small business made stronger and more resilient through a partnership with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. In Cape May Courthouse, you will find Coho Brewing Company, founded in 2018 by that woman, Karen Buckingham. Coho carries, Pat, pay close attention here, a crime and justice theme throughout many of their brews, including beers such as Crime Scene, Hazius Corpus, and Chalk Outline and a more recent addition to their taps, Back the Blue. And this one's important because the proceeds from that one go to support the National Night Out program in local youth camps. Karen also hosts cornhole tournaments at the brewery to benefit Cape May County's canine units. Pat, I think it's only a matter of time till you, are, you and I are competing in one of those cornhole tournaments down at Coho Brewing Company. And needless to say, we'll get a ride there and home. Working alongside the EDA, COHO received grants that were vital to protecting the jobs of Karen's 10 employees, as well as keeping the rent and utilities paid up. I connected with Karen last Wednesday to check in and see how everything was going in the brewery, and she and her team are confident in a strong future. So to Karen and everyone at COHO, thank you for your keeping our craft brewing industry strong and for your role in making New Jersey a destination locale for beer lovers from across the nation. Check them out, by the way. They're at 28 Indian Trail, 28 Indian Trail in Cape May Courthouse. And one last thing for today uh, before we hand things over to Judy. Last week, our administration released New Jersey's first ever climate change resiliency strategy, a science-based blueprint for protecting New Jersey's vulnerable communities, environment, economy, and infrastructure from the impacts of climate change. This report is the culmination of two years of collaboration among 17 state departments of agents and agencies. 
It sets priorities to guide state and local climate action and includes over 100 recommendations for fighting climate impacts, including sea level rise, chronic flooding, rising temperatures, and more frequent and intense storm events. With the floods, most recently from Tropical Storm Ida, and before that in fewer communities, but still devastating from Henri, with all of that still fresh in our minds, this report takes on an added importance. I thank everyone who was involved in its creation. And to take a look for yourself, head over to the Department of Environmental Protection's homepage at, at that website at the bottom, nj.gov slash DEP. Particular shout out to Commissioner Sean LaTourette and his team. Again, nj.gov slash DEP. With that, I'll turn things over to the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persa Kelly. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. I would like to extend my condolences on the passing of uh, General Colin Powell, true American hero. It is reported that the general was fully vaccinated. We do not know if he had received a booster. However, this shows that this virus is unrelenting. This virus searches out vulnerable elderly individuals, specifically those with underlying conditions. To boost protection, we have been encouraging those eligible for the Pfizer booster to receive it as soon as possible. Residents who are eligible for a Pfizer booster dose can now make an appointment through the New Jersey Vaccine Scheduling System, known as NJVSS. When you visit NJVSS's scheduling system, the website, covidvaccine.nj.gov, you will see a new button that reads, register and schedule for booster. If you have pre-registered in the NJVSS system, you will need to verify your name, email address, phone number, and birth date. You will then receive an email inviting you to schedule an appointment for your Pfizer booster dose. Please ensure that you are using the same information you registered with initially. So, uh, that is how the system will recognize you and search for your record. If you are new to NJVSS, you will fill out the registration form and then directly proceed to scheduling your booster dose appointment online. Many sites also accommodate individuals who walk in without booking appointments. The New Jersey Vaccine Call Center is available to assist individuals seeking dose appointments and can be reached at 1-855-568-0511. That's 1-855-568-0545. I would urge those who are eligible to get a booster shot as soon as possible so you have that extra protection as the holidays approach. More and more people will be eligible for the booster in the coming weeks, so, so please schedule your booster now. To help clarify the timing of when individuals are eligible for a Pfizer booster, the department has added a pop-up message to its homepage nj.gov slash health that provides the date of when you would have had to receive your second Pfizer dose in order to be eligible. For example, today it says if you completed your second dose of Pfizer on or before April 18th, 2021, you are now likely eligible for a booster dose. As we have shared previously, more than 1.1 million residents who received their primary Pfizer series through the end of March are already eligible to receive their booster dose. That includes those 65 years and older, those with underlying medical conditions at high risk for severe COVID, or individuals who work in a job that places them at higher risk, including 650,000 healthcare workers, grocery store workers, public transit workers, education staff, including teachers, support staff, and daycare workers, first responders, including firefighters and police, transit workers, food, agricultural workers, and U.S. Postal Service workers. We recognize that not all of those who are eligible know they are eligible for a booster. So in order to help raise awareness, the department has advertisements on billboards, trains, buses, transit platform outlining eligibility. In regard to the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson boosters, the FDA's Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, VRBAC, recommended last week that the FDA issue emergency use authorizations to provide for booster doses for certain Moderna, 
recipients at six or more months after their primary series, and for all J&J &J recipients at two or more months after the first dose. Like the currently authorized Pfizer booster, the FDA's advisory panel recommends that Moderna booster eligibility include individuals over 65 years of age, individuals 18, 18 through 64 years of age with a high risk of um, severe COVID, and individuals 18 through 64 of age whose frequent institutional or occupational exposure to SARS-CoV-2 puts them at high risk of serious complications. The CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices will meet on October 20th and October 21st to offer further recommendations on use of the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines. In New Jersey, the Delta variant now represents 100% of variants circulating. Given how transmissible the Delta variant is, boosters are going to be vital in reducing the spread of COVID-19 virus in our state. The governor went over the breakthrough cases collected by the department's communicable disease service through the New Jersey Hospital Association's portal. Hospitals are also sending in their real-time data. As of October 17th, of the 545 adults hospitalized for COVID-19 in the state, 423, or 78% of them, were not fully vaccinated. While no vaccine, vaccine is 100%, COVID-19 vaccines continue to remain highly effective in protecting people against COVID-19 and hospitalization and death. It is also important that you get your second dose and a booster or third dose if eligible. Moving on to my daily report, as the governor shared, our hospitals reported 890 hospitalizations of COVID-19 positive patients or persons under investigation. We have no new reports of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children and at the state veterans home since our last press briefing, sadly, there has been one new COVID-19 related death of a resident at the Vineland home. At the state psychiatric hospitals, there are no new cases among patients at the hospitals. The daily percent positivity uh, as of October 14th in the state is 3.96%. The northern part of the state reports 3.18 the central part of the state, 4.44, and the southern part of the state, 5.01. So that concludes my daily report. Please continue to stay safe, get vaccinated to protect ourselves, our family, friends, and our children. Thank you. Judy, thank you for all of that. I, I don't want to put you and Ed on the spot. Far too early to, create, uh, to, to, um, to claim victory but it's not, the, the numbers feel like now they're moving slowly but surely in a better direction, right? Yeah. Rate of transmission is dropped in the, in the standard, which is sort of a one-day snapshot is even lower. Yeah. Hospitalizations, I mentioned, under 900 for six days in a row. And, and, and it you know, feels like we're battling. The battle is the variant perhaps starting to crest, but at the same time living our lives much more inside. And, and, uh, and obviously vaccines and masking are two big weapons. Is that fair? Yeah. Ed, how are you feeling about things? Since I was born to worry, but uh, yeah. and be somewhat pessimistic, no, I, I agree. Uh, we're clearly in a much better situation than we were last year. We're clearly moving slowly but correctly in the right direction. We have a lot of stuff going in our favor. We do have a uh, vaccine obviously increasing throughout the population. We do have increasing immunity. We do have a population that knows the right things that they should be doing and for the most part goes ahead and follows those right things. Uh, overall, look across the country, you see similar patterns so that that's also in our favor. And of course, what's going against it? What's going against it, as you mentioned, cold the weather coming, holidays coming, people gathering more, uh, COVID fatigue, other things that that can impact us as well, but without a doubt, we're in much better shape than we were a year ago, and uh, hopefully we continue in the right direction. Amen. I, I left holidays off the list, but that's a good reminder. It's not just that we're going inside. We're probably going to be gathering with others a lot more. 
Just do it smart, folks. Uh, and again, if you're inside and you're not, if, if, if you're with your family and you know what everyone's vaccination status is, I think you can have a pretty normal holiday. But if you're inside and you don't know that, particularly if you're packed in closely together, um, put one of these on or take, take, the, take the party outside. Um, that was almost sounded like a let's take this outside <laughs> moment, Pat, which I'm not going to do with you. I always look down and see a firearm there, so I'm not going to ever do that to you. Colonel Callahan, welcome. What do you got? Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, glad to report that there's really not much to report uh, from this side. Still uh, all firing on all cylinders with, with FEMA from not only COVID but from uh, Ida response. Um, and the week's weather ahead looks good, and, and I'm even more happy to report that in monitoring the tropics that right now there's nothing going on down there. So uh, that's all I have, Go. Let's hope it stays that way. Yes, sir. Uh, amen. Uh, Sam, is that you? We're going to start with Sam. Uh, Jamil's got the, uh, the microphone. Before we do, um, I, I didn't say this on Wednesday because I wasn't 100% sure of the schedule. We're going to be back together again Wednesday at 1, but it's going to be virtual. So we'll be on the usual platforms when we're on virtual. We're moving around the state pretty good these days, so for a bunch of different reasons. Mm -hmm. So bear with us Wednesday, 1 o'clock, uh, virtual. And with that, Sam, good afternoon. Afternoon, also, Governor. Also, one other caveat. I'm losing my voice, so if we could give me some, uh, uh, a little bit fewer asks than normal, if you could, Sam. Fair enough. Uh, your vaccine or test order for state employees takes effect today. Do you have any data on the percentage of state employees who are vaccinated? And if not, why not? And then second, uh, on the weekly testing for unvaccinated state workers, are those tests being provided by state agencies at the workplace or are workers expected to get tested on their own time? Yeah, this is a, a good question for several reasons. And Judy, you should weigh in um, as well. We had used, and I think Brent, you were asking about this separately, we had used October 18th as the date that we wanted to get folks back in. Um, I think we made the right decision to do that in a phased uh, manner, particularly somewhat related to your question, Sam, is to make sure that we could have a t smooth testing rollout. So we decided, I think, again, uh, I, I think this is the right decision. We decided with some of the bigger agencies to focus on them first, particularly the ones that have a high customer facing reality. reality. So today you've got back in, first of all, you've got our front office, uh, which has basically been in. Uh, but in addition to that, you've got children and families are in today. Department of Labor is in today. Motor vehicles is in today. Other departments will get phased in over the coming weeks. I think within labor, the one stops are not yet uh, open, they will be phased in over the next number of weeks. And I, I don't off the top of my head, head have a schedule, but the folks who work in all of those departments um, are aware of what their schedule is. Um, and I don't know, I don't know, at least off the top of my head, what percentage are vaccinated. It's a very high percentage. Judy, do you happen to have that number? We can get back to you on that and any other color on the testing. Part of the reason on testing is we wanted to make this as as user friendly as possible. So whenever possible, we want the testing to be done uh, that, such that there's no pain taken by the employees. But we'll get back, Aliana, if there's any other color on either the rate or testing color, get back to Sam if you could. Thank you. Brent. Did we miss an announcement on that being phased in? Because I thought when it was announced it was going to be October 18th is when everyone went back, because uh, that's certainly what we reported. Yeah. Uh, Two, do, does the vaccine or testing requirement apply to those who haven't reported today, meaning state workers who aren't in today? And can you give us a breakdown of breakthrough cases, how many had pre-existing conditions, which conditions, and what is the age and race breakdown? Is that breakthrough general? Yeah. Um, it's possible you missed an announcement, uh, but this is the way we've been thinking about it for some time. So if, if, if it's on us, that's my bad. Uh, but we, we, we made the decision particularly the, the testing because you've got the, because we still think it's right to have the testing option uh, as opposed to uh, going through other walls. Um, that's the area that has made it more complicated. 
I don't know whether or not I can say definitively, Paramel, what if, what if you're in a department that's not in, in person today? Yeah, so the vaccination requirement applies to everyone starting today, but the testing opt-out only applies if the workers are reporting to the work site regularly. So if workers still working from home, they're required to be vaccinated, but the, the testing option just doesn't come into play for them. And, and did you agree with my list of who's in? So it's motor vehicles, Department of Labor, children and families in the front office. Yes. Yep. And we will chop through that. Um, Ed, breakthrough cases, uh, Brent's question about any, any sense of, uh, I think, uh, quite uh, um, triggered by others by other reasons by General Powell's passing what percentage do you have any more uh, understanding of comorbidities yes I have some of that here and other we can get for you let me just kind of begin in general when we're talking about across age groups yes we follow that um, and when you look at just the rate of breakthroughs across age group your rates are relatively similar, running between about 0.6% to 0.7%, 0.8% in, in that range or so. And again, I can get you those exact numbers. As, as would be expected, when you talk about hospitalization and deaths, that begins to change with the older you get, the more susceptible you are and the more likely you are to go ahead and be hospitalized or, or die, although those numbers are also quite low. So for example, hospitalizations, the 18 to 29 year olds have a 0.004% chance of being hospitalized, whereas those over 80 have a 0.198%. And a lot of numbers, I don't want to read through everything, but that's the that's general idea. And, and similarly, when it comes to death, the younger you are, you're extremely unlikely to die. As you get older, you're just very unlikely to die um, in breakthrough cases. So that continues with that as well. Uh, similarly, when we talk about the percentage of people who have underlying medical conditions, then yes, um, of the 1,718 total hospitalized breakthrough cases, 1,179 of them were known to have pre-existing conditions. Um, Similarly, as far as deaths go, so the 362 deaths, 262 of them were known to have pre-existing conditions as well. Uh, so, so about two thirds uh, in both cases? About two thirds to three quarters of, of all, and, and a small percentage are unknown. So, so yes, basically, and, and those numbers are always gonna change a little bit, but that, that's basically what we're seeing, which is what you would expect. In general, the older you are, the more pre-existing conditions you are, the more likely you're going to have a bad outcome should you get a breakthrough case. I, I, would, could, I, I would bet, and I don't know this, but of the sort of 550 hospitalizations that did not have some comorbidities, I'll bet you that's an older demographic. I don't have that exactly yeah. in, in front of me, but, but I expect you're right. right. And yeah. we don't always have, you know, tremendously detailed information on every single individual, but, but yes, you know, and, and to me, and I'm going to go very slightly out of the lane for a second, and, and I'm sorry, you know, people have asked about whether, you know, Colin Powell's death suggests that there's something wrong with the vaccination or some reason why people shouldn't get vaccinated. And my answer is really just the opposite. It shows that people need to get vaccinated because you can't protect every single person who's going to get the vaccine. The vaccine we've always said is not perfect. It's extremely good, but you know, it, it is not armor that, that lets, never lets anything in. And the way that you help protect those people who are most vulnerable is by not letting the virus get to them in the first place. And the best way to do that is to go out there and, and get vaccinated. It protects you, and just as importantly, and maybe more importantly, it protects those around you who are more vulnerable. Well said. Thank you for that, Brent. Joey, let's go to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So two quick, quest quick follow-up questions on the state worker return. Um, one, can you give some kind of ballpark about um, you know, how, what percentage of the total state employees are, are back full-time today? You know, saying like these certain departments, but like what, you know, what proportion is that? And then just to clarify on the vax versus testing requirement, um, do you mean that the, the, the requirements don't come into play yet at all for people who are still working mostly at home? Because you were saying that only the vax requirement and not the testing requirement comes into play 
I just, can you clarify that point? And then one totally unrelated question. Uh, Governor Murphy, do you know how you plan on voting yet? Uh, mail ballot early, in-person uh, election day. Yeah. I'm ho hoping to vote for myself. Let's see if we can get that off my chest. Um, let me go back to the other ones. I don't have a percentage, but we can come back to you. Um, again, we're, we are, are the two principles that are guiding the sequence are uh, big operations and customer facing. But we'll, we'll come back to you. And I think, Paramel, you may want to come in and, and uh, add more color on this. I, th I think the, to, to put a fine point on this, um, the testing piece, if you're working from home, is not enforced until you come into the office. But we do expect folks to be vaccinated. And when they come in, if they're not vaccinated for whatever reason, then they're going to have to start doing the testing regime. Does that make sense? Um, no news yet on voting, but um, it's, it's a good question and it's a good opportunity f for me to say something that has nothing to do with me, that, that's just about voting. Um, you've really got three options still left. You can still vote by mail, uh, and we proved last year especially that we're, we're, we're good at that as a state. Uh, you can vote on Election Day, which is November 2nd, Tuesday, November 2nd. But this year, the new great wrinkle uh, is we have in-person early voting for nine straight days beginning on October 30, uh, 23rd, which is this Saturday, through October 31st, which is Halloween Sunday. So nine straight days, Saturday, Sunday, Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Other states that have done it, and by the way, in your county, there are um, a handful, if not more, locations in your county. Um, and it's not every polling station that's open, but there's a significant amount of them that are open. Uh, and because of the investments we've made and the great work by our county clerks and boards of election and their staffs, uh, it's not like election day where you have to go to your school that you vote in. You could go to any one of these places that are available in your county. Um, other states that have done this have seen participation go up dramatically. You see a particular bump on weekends because there's a lot of folks who combine, at least in their mind, if not in their actions, worship with voting, so you have something that called souls to the polls, uh, which is a, a big tradition in a lot of other states, and my gut tells me we'll see that as an emerging tradition in New Jersey as well. But no, no news yet, but we'll come back to you when we do. Let's go to Ken. Is that you, Ken? Yes, sir. It's nice to see you. How do I know it's Ken? Because I love that Your mask. favorite mask. <laughs> Uh, just two questions. One, we've learned Friday that there was an issue with the vendor who was supposed to provide testing for uh, teachers and schools, and they were on the deadline uh, today as well. Uh, what is the status of that vendor, and uh, how soon did they tell you, if they told you anything, that they'll be up and running at all the districts that opted in to have the state pay for testing? The second question involves New Jersey parents for a virtual choice. Uh, it was almost two months ago when I came here and asked if you had met with them yet. And they've informed me that they have yet to hear from anybody in your office. Do you still plan on meeting with them? Are you still interested in talking to their, them about their particular issue concerning the lack of a virtual choice in school? On the first one, Judy, tell me if I've got this right. We did have a vendor issue. Um, uh, and my guess is it's gonna take the next few weeks to sort that out. Uh, and we're working with the districts that are impacted by that. Is that fair to say? That, that time sounds we're right? We're pr pretty much settled with the uh, opportunity for each district to identify uh, the vendors that we have uh, vetted uh, through the procurement process. Uh, we have uh, three regional vendors uh, that are available to the schools, or the schools can contract on their own. Uh, and we have over a thousand testing sites uh, every county has a, test, uh, a testing opportunity uh, that can be used as well. It's like all these other big steps that we've taken. The, the first few weeks, you have to sort of, not everything is a straight line, is it fair to say? So when, you, when we started testing originally, uh, remember, folks, it feels like a million years ago, the line of cars at, uh, up at Bergen County and down in Homedale and uh, so, but we, we will get there, and, and uh, this is going to be something that we think will ultimately be a very natural uh, process. 
I don't know that I personally committed to meeting with them, but I said that we would certainly meet with them, and Paramount help me follow up on that, because we, 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 if, if people are reasonable, we meet with them, period. Uh, e even in some cases when they, they may be unreasonable. I completely respect the, 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 their, their passion, but we're, we're not, unless this virus takes a turn that is dramatic, uh, we're not going down the virtual route. We've, we know now statistically the, the, the devastation on learning loss, uh, particularly in underserved communities, the mental health issues, including with educators and staff. So assuming that we believe that we are within a reasonable range of uh, that first objective, which is to keep everybody in our school community safe, we're gonna stay in person. Again, every time you think you got this figured out, this thing takes a turn you don't expect. God willing, it won't take that kind of, kind of turn, but uh, Paramel, you'll help me follow up. Uh, I, I don't know that it'll be me, but if people are reasonable and wanna present a case, we're, we are always willing to listen. Thank you. Good to see you. Alex, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dr. Lipschitz, how does a breakthrough case happen? Can you simply explain in layman's terms how a COVID-19 or a COVID-19 variant is able to sort of penetrate the protection of a vaccine? Is it a breakthrough or more of a break around? For you, Commissioner, I know we've already talked about this a little bit, but can you just have a message to send out to people who are more skeptical about getting vaccinated after General Powell's death? I know that you folks have said that it's actually an argument for vaccination. But can you understand people who look at this situation and say, he got vaccinated and died anyway, why should I get vaccinated? I just wanted you to address that point. And for you, Governor, why is it taking so long for the one-stop career centers to reopen? Motor Vehicles has been doing in-person services all throughout the pandemic, for most of the pandemic, and though they've had their problems, they're open. Why is it taking so long for them to reopen? And when you say weeks, can you give us a time frame or a date? And finally, I wanted to revisit something that we talked about on Wednesday. On Wednesday, you said that you went to a political event and you were not wearing a mask indoors because everyone there was fully vaccinated. Well, hours after you said that, you went to the Monmouth County Chairman's Dinner and you didn't wear a mask. You were in front of a packed ballroom of people. Are you saying that you knew the vaccination status of every single person in that room? And can you understand folks who are questioning why your mask wearing depends on the audience? And in fact, here, why are we still wearing masks during this briefing? You're not wearing one. You're fully vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated. I bet my bottom dollar everyone in this room's fully vaccinated. Are we just doing this for show here? I love the way you ask these. By the way, your question about one stops put the Motor Vehicles Commission in a positive light. That's the first time since we've been in the pandemic. So I want to make sure the Motor Vehicles folks are, are listening to that. Um, I don't have a specific reason on one stops, but DOL is coming in uh, in sort of headquarters today. Uh, and my guess is it's a matter of a few weeks. So I don't, I'm not gonna, I don't have a specific date, but my guess is the next two or three weeks, unless my colleagues see that differently. Um, we have a requirement in the state. We, we take our, we walk into these, uh, for viewers who don't see, we walk in wearing these, we leave wearing these. Um, we take them off to speak. We're, we're six feet apart from each other. We're in a state building and that's still the requirement. So that's the specific answer to why we have them here, and I hope that won't last forever and always. Trust me, I don't like wearing them any more than you do. Um, I don't think anyone in this state wears a mask indoors more than I do. Uh, so I, 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 when I speak, I take my mask off. Uh, I sat at a table uh, in that second event with people who I know were vaccinated. I knew who I was sitting with. I got up and spoke. I, was, I had it on when I came in, and I put it on when I left. These are folks, not you, because I think you, you call balls and strikes, but. Folks are reaching for, for straws here in terms of the politics, and I'll leave it at that. Um, I think your first two questions are, are really, really good, and I think in, in, uh, and I, uh, it's but very simply, how does a breakthrough actually happen if you've been fully vaccinated? And secondly, one more time, the rationale on why, notwithstanding the overwhelming tragedy of General Powell's death, uh, it turns out the fact of the matter is you're a lot safer if you're vaccinated than if you're not vaccinated. Ed, do you want, Judy, with Judy's blessing, we'll get Ed to address both of those, um, please. So when you are vaccinated, several things happen. The thing that people hear about happening and one of the major things is that your body begins to make antibodies that protects you against the virus coming in. In the past, I've kind of explained the antibodies as being a, like a glove covering to try to keep over the hooks of the virus that's trying to 
grab onto you. Um, and the vaccine works extremely well by doing that. Almost everyone, again, not everyone, some people can't uh, generate a, a good response, but almost everyone out there generates a very good response. They make these antibodies, and the antibodies work well at protecting those viruses from invading the cells. But they're not perfect. They're not perfect for a couple of reasons. First off, it is possible to overwhelm that type of defense. And <coughs> To mix my analogies, we've also talked about how vaccines kind of like wearing an umbrella in the rain. You know, if it's pouring out there, if you're getting exposed by a virus all over the place, if people are infected or coughing on you all over, you know, you can overwhelm your body's response and you can become infected. Um, and in addition to that, the vaccines are developed to produce these antibodies. The antibodies, for the most part, are in your blood system. They're not for the most part up in your nasal passages and other places where the virus first often comes. So it is possible that the virus can come in, it can take hold, for example, in your nose, can begin to cause either no symptoms or mild symptoms and begin to replicate before your body's antibodies can get up there and really fight it off. And that's also why over and over again we talk about how the vaccine is particularly effective at protecting against hospitalization and death. You know, that's really what we're looking to do. We, if you got a mild cold from this, people would consider that to be a tremendous win. And, and that can happen because it can take a little while for the body's immune system to, to respond and get the antibodies and its response up to that area where it needs it to be. Um, so you can still become ill from that. Uh, so that's basically why, the, again, the vaccine is not perfect. And, and of course, that's an oversimplification and how a vaccine breakthrough occurs. And to come back to your question about do these cases and do these deaths and, and everything else suggest that there's something wrong with the vaccine and that we shouldn't get vaccinated? Again, I'm going to say absolutely not. To me, it, it's the opposite. And to again try to come up with a quick analogy, <clears throat> you know, imagine that you're in a dry forest and somebody throws a match into the middle of the forest. What's going to happen? It's going to take off. The fire is going to spread very rapidly all over the place and you'll get a, a huge conflagration in, in no time at all. Now imagine instead that people are vaccinated, and by vaccinated, in my analogy, it's now rained. It, it's wet all over the place. Yes, I throw that match out there. I might find a dry spot. I might get some sparks. It might find a couple other places that it could spread to, but it's not going to spread anywhere near as widely or as quickly or as fast, and it won't be as serious because you have this protection out there. And the same thing happens with the virus as it's trying to spread from person to person. Yes, the vaccine is not perfect, and yes, it could spread occasionally from somebody who is vaccinated to somebody else who is vaccinated, but it's very difficult for it to do that, and it's not going to keep on doing that, and it's not going to keep on spreading widely. So by getting that wide ring of vaccination, it's kind of like protecting that forest against that fire. You keep things from totally engulfing the, the place in flames, and, and you really make everything much more manageable, and the people who do get sick tend not to get it as sick in general. Ed, thank you. Well done. Thank you, Alex. Sir. Good afternoon, Governor. Thank you for your time. Question from John Mooney. With today's deadline for school personnel and state workers to be either vaccinated or subject to weekly testing, any update on statewide compliance numbers or issues? And do you worry about losing workers or teachers who don't wish to comply? Question from Leah Mishkin. Earlier this month, you said the state would get creative in getting aid to undocumented Ida victims who can't get FEMA aid. New York has set aside $27 million for this purpose. Is New Jersey going to create a similar fund? Question from Brenda Flanagan. Governor, what is your response to a lawsuit from 30 teachers and state workers saying the testing mandate for unvaccinated teachers and state workers is unconstitutional under the 4th and 14th Amendments? Thank you. Um, I don't have a, I think we've hit some of these uh, to some extent already. Um, I, I don't have a specific uh, number for you statewide, but we'll get that back to you. Uh, just, Judy's got a bunch of districts that are now self-reporting. The numbers are high in terms of vaccination rates as we expected, uh, but it's an incomplete list, so I don't want to give a, 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 even an incomplete answer, That, but it's within the range of any expectation, Judy, I think we would have had. Um, you, you know, I'll tell you, when you've got a vaccination mandate with a testing option, um, I think that's a reasonable, and, and in schools, everyone's required to wear a mask. I think not happily, but that's the package. I don't think that's unreasonable. So if people 
sadly look at that and they view it unreasonable, then God bless them, that's the decision they're going to make. But I don't expect we're going to have a whole lot of those people. That, that to me is a reasonable place. Again, not wild about the masking. We know vaccines are our best weapon. We know masking is our second best we weapon and testing gives us the information that we need. So nothing, nothing really in that I think addresses my I won't comment on any of these suits, uh, but that's at least conceptually my, would be my answer about uh, the, the, the group that you mentioned that was suing us. I still hope that we can find more money for the undocumented. I, that, I stand by that. We, we were able to cobble together $40 million, uh, and I know there are a lot of legislators who want to work with us to find more of that, and, and I continue to be more than open-minded on that. Uh, and if some legislation comes my way, without getting, you know, obviously, the devil's in the details, but conceptually, that's something that I would support, uh, and I still expect that to happen. Thank you. I can't see who's that. Is that, is that Trish back there? Okay, let's go back, and then we'll come, da Dave, down to you to finish this off. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. How many school districts were allowed to have extensions because of the testing vendor issue? And maybe Commissioner Persichilli, can you tell us more about what the issue was? Was it with all three of the regional testing vendors? Is it because of an overwhelming demand for testing or is it something else? And then if a teacher or a state worker, for example, is not vaccinated and then does not comply with the testing requirement, what happens? What are the repercussions? Do they have a certain amount of tests they can miss before they have disciplinary action or termination? Thank you. Thank you. Before you answer that, Judy, um, I should say that, as usual, Rob Sara Angelo is, is looking in, and he is in the category, I think, in this de Department of Labor. I got a qu couple of questions over here. You asked about the one stops. Um, I think he, he has been uh, trying, which I think is a smart way to approach this in, on something like this, manage expectations and exceed the expectations. And he reminds me, in fact, that there are a lot of one stops that are open for uh, appointments uh, as we speak. So he is uh, going around making some stops today to check on that. So it's, it's in fact, a better picture. Assuming it's by appointment, it's a better picture than, um, than we were expecting, and that's, that's a, good, a good thing. Judy, any, any comment on how many districts are impacted by this? And I'll ask Paramel to answer the question if you don't comply. And I assume the noncompliance, Trish, is not the vaccine noncompliance, but the testing piece, right? Yeah, I don't have the number. If we've granted under any extensions, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Well, can we come back to you yeah. on that first one? Um, Paramount, what happens if I am not vaccinated, which is a bad decision, but then I also don't comply with the testing requirement? Yeah, so assuming that the teachers unionize, there's a, a process of discipline that's worked out between the union and the school district, so it's part of their negotiations. Thank you. Dave, we're going to ask you to bring us home. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I apologize in advance, Ed. You're doing a lot of talking today, but I have some questions that maybe the governor will throw over to you, and I know there may be some extra cash in that for you. So, um, With regard to the boosters, specifically, how effective is getting a booster shot? Do we have any sense? You know, you talked about the whole picture of antibodies increasing and so forth, but specifically, how much more effective is getting a booster than not getting a booster after six months? Um, do we have any idea how long the booster shots are going to last? Because, you know, some people may have gotten the booster and now there's like, well, do I get the other type of booster the next time it's due and when might that be? Is it going to be a matter of another variant perhaps showing up? And on the better than last year outlook that you were talking about, Governor, and also Dr. Lifshitz, um, what is your message to people who think that the pandemic is probably winding down, they don't really need to be vaccinated, they're going to have a holiday dinner or a party, and this would not really present that much of a risk anymore. Do you think this is reasonable? Do you think this is selfish? Thank you. Let me start, Ed, and, and you and Judy may want to um, weigh in. Um, we're good, thank you. Uh, I, I think on the boosters that what I've read, Ed, is it's multiples more effective. So I, Ed, Ed can give you the numbers. So it's not just like 20% more, but it's 3x, 5x, 10x 
more protection. Um, but again, Ed will weigh in. I think the answer is we don't know yet on the boosters and how long they last. I don't think anyone has hung their hand on that one unless, some, unless something's happened that I missed. And maybe more importantly on your last question, it's better, it feels like it's getting better, but this is not finished. You know, you've still got 800 and some, 70 something people in the hospital. People are still passing. So literally in the hospitals yesterday, so this is not like we're comparing this over time, literally, literally yesterday, uh, there were 12 folks who died to, yet to be confirmed. Um, and so this is significant. 83 people went into the hospital yesterday. We have a total of 890, pardon me, in the hospital. I, I personally am of the opinion, but w this thing's taken t turns you don't expect. It's a sine curve that with each hump is less than the hump that preceded it. And probably there's some uh, logarithmic relationship between the heights. So I, I'm prepared with going inside and holidays that we're going to come off of this and then we're going to go. But my, my prediction for what it's worth is that we then come back up again after those uh, gatherings. But again, it's not, please God, not as lethal and not as high as it was in the prior, prior runs. But Ed, how effective are the boosters? Um, how long do they last? And I guess to you and Judy, and Judy gets the last word here. How, what's, what's our message to folks coming up over the next three months? Colder weather, lots of holidays. Ed, do you want to start? Sure. As to exactly how much better the boosters are, I wish I could tell you exactly. And, and the problem is we don't know for sure. We, we know based upon studies, and there have been some big ones in Israel and other places, and we're continuing to gather that data. We know from the drug makers' own studies as to how much antibodies increase and what they've been seeing in the people who've been boosted as well. So we do know that clearly it boosts antibodies and clearly it adds protection. Now, there are some people who maintain protection well and don't even need that. And there are other people, particularly, again, the older people who tend to lose immunity faster who will benefit more. Uh, but exactly how much and how much is going to protect you and how long it's going to last and what will happen down the road if there is a new variant, unfortunately, those are all things which only time will tell for sure. Uh, clearly, even with two doses, you are protected, uh, more protected than if you got none, but we do strongly encourage for maximum protection that those who are eligible go ahead and get boosted. As to the general question, as, as you know, what would we say or what would I say to people about coming holidays and things? Well, I sitting here and hearing about Colin Powell, I'm just quickly reminded of another ex-Secretary of State who, who once said, you know, how do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? And, and to me, that's kind of my message back here is, is, you know, we have made so much progress. People have done so much good hard work. Uh, they know what they should be doing. They know that vaccines can help and vaccines have been helping. How do you go ahead and slide back from that to the point where you have just unnecessary deaths happening, unnecessary illness happening? And, and that would be my message to people out there. You know, you don't want to be that person who down the road is just saying, oh, I, I, you know, I can't take it back now. It's too late. It's too important to take those chances. Well said. Judy, anything you want to add? I just think we have to be aware that last December, because of the gatherings, we did see significant increases. And it's just not one thing alone that will protect us. It's being aware that vaccination is number one. Masking is important. Social distancing, washing your hands frequently. A lot of the preventive, layered preventive strategies do work. Uh, I can tell you the Department of Health, on this, the floor that I am on, we have been in every single day since March 4th of 2020. And no one, no one has contracted COVID at work. That's incredible. Thank God. Yes. Um, so I think there's a common sense element to this. It's clearly, I'll put these on as, I, as we round out here. It's vaccinations without question. And if you're eligible for the booster, get it. And I think we wait and, and let's follow the guidance. That's one other thing. I, I think folks just making their own decision about which booster to get. Let's follow the CDC guidance on when and what. Um, and masking, we know, 
is, a, is, is the second most effective piece. And the, the common sense piece to me is, is what it comes back to so often. You know, what's our setup like? The, set, the setup here is extremely um, preventative, right? So we're all separated from each other. Um, this is, you know, you, you, you could walk in here and I have the confidence that I do when we do to take our masks off and speak without worrying. If you're in a bar and you're packed in and you just don't know what any, everybody there, you just have no way of knowing what their status is, that's, a, that's at the other end of the spectrum. And I think folks, you know, sort of having a sense of where that spectrum looks like, particularly during the holidays, and, and by the millions, folks have done the right thing in New Jersey, so we should wear that as a badge of honor. So Judy and Ed, um, I echo Dave's comments. We got our money's worth out of Ed today. Judy, thank you. As always, Pat, Paramel, Jamil, Aliana. Again, we'll be with you uh, virtually on Wednesday, same time, 1 o'clock, but virtually. Everybody stay safe. God bless.